that my um, all of my career over many years has been about developing psychological interventions for psychosis. And it's probably only about over the last 10 years that I've been focusing on, I guess, what you would call more complex presentations of psychosis. So uh, we work with people with uh, violence and aggression, people with suicide problems, which is what today is about, but also people with dual diagnoses like substance misuse, people with learning disabilities and psychosis. So this is just really about talking about um, suicide in psychosis and about how we've had to develop and adapt interventions based on our understanding of su psychological suicide mechanisms to try and help us to really understand what's going on for people with psychosis who are feeling suicidal and how treatments and interventions need to be changed or adapted to accommodate that. And I suppose everybody says this in every talk, but this is certainly not all of my own work. There's a huge team of people from the university, but also from um, the NHS who were working on this area. Um, and also, you know, a key part of that group is our service user groups um, that we work with, uh, who offer an invaluable aspect to the work that we're doing in terms of sort of developing our research questions, but also helping with how we implement clinical trials, what outcome measures we use, how we need to adapt outcome measures, how we need to adapt things like information sheets and consent forms. Um, and they work alongside with us in analysis and in dissemination as well. So a really invaluable part of the team. So just to sort of set the scene with regard to psychosis um, in 2012, 10 years now actually, which seems to be just yesterday, um, there was a really good report by uh, what's called the Schizophrenia Commission, who was a, a group of people who were commissioned to review um, a lot of the, the state of play really with regard to schizophrenia, psychosis, services and so on. And this is just a little bit of a quote um, from that, which I think really helps you to sort of get an idea of what the experience of psychosis is which sort of imagine suddenly developing an illness in which you're bombarded with voices from forces you cannot see stripped of your ability to understand what's real and what's not real you can't trust your senses your mind plays tricks on you and your family or friends seem part of a conspiracy to harm you and i think that really sets the scene in terms of what the experience of psychosis is particularly in young people who first develop um, psychotic experiences. Um, it certainly is associated with a lot of stigma. People with severe mental health problems, schizophrenia, do have a shorter lifespan than people um, without, something like 20 years, which is rather unbelievable in this day and age. And it's very, very common. It's a ubiquitous phenomenon, this psychosis. So it's something that we really need to focus on. There's a link there in the slides um, to that particular report if you're interested. Um, and in terms of treatment of psychosis, there is NICE guidance, uh, which keeps getting updated. It says 2014 on there. there may, I'm sure there is an update since then. But um, the main psychological treatment for psychosis is cognitive behaviour therapy. Um, and NICE recommends that CBT should be offered to everyone with the diagnosis of schizophrenia and psychosis. It should start right in the acute phase when people first present or if not then, later, including in inpatient settings. And we should also be offering family interventions for people with psychosis and their families or carers or friends. Um, they also recommend that there are specific things we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't be offering routinely things like general counselling, supportive psychotherapy, social skills training or adherence therapy to medication. Um, that's mainly because there's no evidence that any of those things are effective in psychosis. Um, having said that, it doesn't mean to say that they aren't helpful for some people, but they're certainly not the first line psychological treatment for people with psychosis. Um, we also particularly have recommendations about early psychosis. So young people who first present to services, actually, it's not always young people. Sometimes people can develop psychosis later in life. Um, the, the psychosis early st psychosis standard says that um, we should be offering 
uh, nice approved care packages for people within two weeks of referral. Now that is similar to the cancer uh, standard where if you present to your GP with risk of cancer, you're seen within cancer services in two weeks. So this is sort of an unheard of um, standard within psychosis. Um, and actually, when this was first announced, it was like, you know, absolutely phenomenal that, you know, you present with symptoms of psychosis, you will be offered a full package of care, which includes psychological treatment. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. However, despite recommendations, uh, implementation of psychological treatments, particularly, has been really, really poor and going back quite a long time. So going back, if you look back about 15 years, uh, there was a review of community mental health service in England, which suggested 46% of service users were offered CBT. It was updated in 2009, but other service surveys that came a bit later were suggesting the implementation was uh, not quite as good as that. And we did a survey around about 2015 and the implementation was really, really terrible with something like about 3% of families of people with psychosis not get, being offered any psychological treatment. So despite all the recommendations, the services for people with psychosis uh, in relation to being offered psychological treatments are not that great. And there are some real centers of excellence and it tends to be more common within early psychosis teams. Um, but we can't guarantee that people with psychosis will all be offered psychological treatments, unfortunately. So I guess that's led us to talk and think a little bit about, well, what is the problem? Why can't we get people with psychosis enough psychological treatments? And what is the problem in this area? So there are a few key issues. Um, Services are not that well geared up for delivering psychological treatments for people with psychosis. There actually are now quite a lot of trained staff, um, but a lot of the staff, the care coordinators, the case managers are really focused on managing cases, managing medication, managing risk. So therapy is not necessarily prioritized and many of them don't feel confident about delivering therapy anyway. Um, although, I'm a bit of a fan of cognitive behavior therapy. It isn't a panacea. And not everybody wants CBT. They may not want therapy. So it's not necessarily suitable for everyone. Uh, we did a, a little bit of a trial and about a third of people actually said, I don't want psychological therapy. So we don't have to give it to everybody. Um, and people with psychosis, they're a very heterogeneous population and different populations may need very different types of intervention and some good examples of that are people with more complex and who are more challenging and amongst that i would include people who are suicidal who self-harm or thoughts about suicide uh, as well as things like aggression and sub substance misuse and the workforce is not very well geared up to deal with those sorts of issues and the evidence base about delivering psychological therapy in those groups is much less developed. I apologize if you can hear some banging. We've got some builders next door who are doing some knocking down some walls. So I hope it's not distracting you from the talk. So what do we do now? We know that CBT for psychosis works and there's a big evidence base about that. And we know that government policy recommends it, but we're not getting it into services as routine treatments. Um, and we need to do that, it's crucial. We need better therapists and better supervision, and we need to pay attention to service user choice about the way they receive treatments, but we need to really address the needs of complex clients. And for those of you that work in the NHS, many people who do present services are actually quite complex, and those needs need to be really incorporated and thought about in terms of delivering services, particularly psychological treatments. So moving on specifically then to think about suicidality and psychosis and by suicidality I'm talking about the whole continuum from suicidal thoughts and images, plans, intent to take a person's life and actually 
taking actions that will be life-threatening and potentially ultimately successful in taking the person's life. So the whole continuum of experiences of suicidality. So suicide in the UK, well, suicide, as I'm sure you're aware, is quite common. Um, many people each year die from taking their own life via suicide attempt. Um, and many attempts every four minutes. Uh, and the figures have only really slightly reduced over the last 30 years, and that's in the general population. When you focus on psychosis and suicide, um, the rates do increase quite a lot. Between 20 to 40% of people with psychosis will attempt suicide in their lifetime. And up to 10% are likely to die from taking their own life. But on top of that, many will experience ongoing thoughts of suicide and self-harm. Um, so not just taking their own life, but troubled by persistent, unwelcome and really distressing thoughts of self-harm and taking their life. People with first episode psychosis may be at higher risk. And we know that using substances um, exacerbates the risk and substance misuse is more common in people with psychosis anyway. So we've got a bit of a double whammy going on of more likely uh, to have suicidal thoughts and feelings and also to use suicide, uh, substance misuse, which will exacerbate problems. So a real mix of difficult challenges within this group. So why should we work um, on suicide in people with um, severe mental illness? Why should we be prioritizing this? Something seems to have happened by, with my screen. Well, one of the reasons why we should prioritise it is just because of what I've just said, is that suicidality is really common. Um, and this is data from the National Confidential Inquiry, which some of you in the audience will be very familiar with. Uh, between 2008 and 2018, there were just over 18,000 deaths identified as patient suicides. So these are people that are in contact with mental health services in the 12 months prior to death. And I guess apart from the sheer ubiquitousness of, of suicidality in the population, one of the things that we really need to think about is the, the, the real social, personal and financial costs for individuals themselves but also for the families, the carers, and the services in which uh, people are being uh, involved with. Suicidal and suicide and suicidal behaviour are huge issues for everybody, just not for the not just for the individual concerned. And if you've worked in inpatient environments where there's been a death through suicide, will be aware of the huge um, repercussions for everybody of of that death. Um, so it's a real issue in terms of something that we should be doing to prioritise. So thinking about what the risk factors are, well, we have risk factors in relation to the general population and for those with psychosis as well. And there's quite a lot of overlap. So things like gender, being male, age, education, employment, and so on. Having a previous history of suicidality, mental health problems, 28% of suicide deaths are in people with known mental health problems. Um, and we also know that an increased risk is associated with psychiatric hospitalization or imprisonment. Um, having depression, psychosis, a history of trauma, diagnosis of personality disorder, I've mentioned already substance and or alcohol misuse, and people who experience adverse life events, which I guess none of those are surprising. The difficulty with that sort of epidemiological research, knowing about all of the risk factors, is that many individuals will be um, what you call false positives. So people may fall into high risk groups, but are not likely to kill themselves. So false positives. So um, this sort of end of the spectrum. And many who do kill themselves don't fall into high risk groups, those false negatives. Um, so we've got a lot of people who we may identify as high risk that are not going to do anything. And we may miss quite a lot of people as well. 
So that's part of the difficulty with looking at risk factors. We're not going to be able to necessarily target anybody, everybody. For some reason, my computer keeps getting stuck. So knowing what the risk factors isn't always that helpful to, de to develop interventions because we haven't really got a good, accurate method of definitely predicting who's going to die by suicide because we can't reduce things like static risk factors. We can't, for example, change gender. Um, and I guess our assessment of risk within services are, are actually quite flawed. Many people in services who die from suicide are, are really considered at no or low risk. So suicide risk assessment scales aren't always the best idea and may have limited clinical utility really and may waste val valuable resources in the sense that spending a lot of time doing loads of risk assessments with patients isn't always that helpful. Maybe we should be spending more time on therapeutic approaches rather than risk assessments. And that's because there's something that we can be done, something that can be done about psychological factors. So even if we can't change those static epidemiological factors, we can change psychological factors. And I guess that's sort of the real driver behind trying to implement psychological therapies in people with psychosis who are suicidal. Part of that being able to develop psychological treatments really is understanding that suicidal behavior. Um, and as I said right at the beginning, suicidal experiences are on a continuum you know, from thinking about death, thinking about taking a life, self-harming, suicide attempts, and actually being successful at taking a life. So suicide lies at the extreme end of, of that continuum. But what that tells us is that there could be all sorts of places where we can intervene with an individual. All aspects of the continuum can be important treatment targets. And really understanding the psychological mechanisms at each point can help us to better understand the individual, what's going on for them, and really enable us to formulate or understand an individualized specific treatment approach for that person. So models of suicide, psychological model of suicide. I mean, there are several psychological models of suicide, the cry of pain model, the um, schematic appraisals model, which is our Manchester model, which I'm sure people in the audience are aware of that. Um, with the idea that there obviously are those epidemiological risk factors at one end and suicide at the other end, um, but that there are psychological mediating factors in the middle there that we might be wanting to target using psychological interventions. And the models all slightly differ in terms of where their emphasis is, but they all identify key psychological features which tend to all include a real feeling of being defeated, extreme hopelessness about the future, and a feeling of being trapped or entrapment. And those are really common amongst all of the psychological models and make those a real target for psychological treatment. Um, and I just want to mention um, Camelia Harris's paper here, which was, uh, Camelia may be in the audience, I don't know. She uh, is working with us on a lot of this suicide work. And she um, did a really good piece of work around understanding those pathways in a little bit more detail um, in psychosis specifically. Um, these were some of the key things that she were identified, which build on what we know about defeat, entrapment and hopelessness. Negative life events were really central to the experience of suicidal thoughts in people with psychosis. Low mood, as you might expect, perceived loneliness and hopelessness, precipitated suicidal thoughts with hopelessness featuring primarily in that transition to, to thoughts, to transition to suicidal plans. So, what Cami was trying to do was to really understand what that pathway was and what might be transitioning people. Psychotic symptoms were really quite crucial. 
So hallucinations and delusions were present at each stage of the pathway, whether it's suicidal thoughts, whether it's plans or attempts. And again, that tells us that actually there's something that we can do with those psychotic symptoms. We know CBT for psychosis works. So we can target those psychotic symptoms in those pathways to suicidality. Uh, she also found that certain types of delusions uh, particularly grandiose delusions, were sometimes perceived to reduce the intensity of suicidal experiences, so that those types of delusions are actually protective. And that's quite an important finding um, in the sense that what we want to do is maybe not necessarily re remove those types of delusions because they are acting protectively. And by doing so, we might make people more vulnerable to suicide. So really understanding those pathways has been crucial to try and help us to deliver um, our treatment approach. So some of the key issues for de developing a psychological therapy based on that work. Sorry if this keeps freezing. Does it look okay from your end? Is there any problems? It looks a bit slow just then, do actually? Anything just come up on the screen then? We've got key issues for therapy, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> That's what I've got as well. Nothing else below it. But just bear with me a minute. Okay. So just some summarising a little bit about what I've just been talking about. Some of the key issues that we need to focus on in therapy is that sense of feeling defeated, believing that there are no options for escape from the current situation that they're in or entrapment are really strongly implicated in suicidal behavior in the sense that i guess suicide can be considered to be an escape from a really intolerable intolerable situation but also intoler intolerable emotions as well and suicide beliefs and thoughts or schema as we might call them drive the suicidal or urges um, and they can be strengthened over time and can be activated at any point in time by a large range of external stimuli, stimuli that may to us seem unrelated uh, especially if they uh, involve psychotic symptoms so trying to understand that for each individual so where psychotic symptoms fit in understand the role of substance misuse if it presents and all those environmental factors that might be feeding into those psychological uh, mechanisms is really, really important, whether it's at the suicidal thought stage or later on in that continuum. And just to summarise the role maybe of psychotic symptoms, um, how might psychotic symptoms really be, be working in this mix of things that are going on for an individual? And is it just that people who have psychotic symptoms are more ill or is it the severity of the psychotic symptoms that's linked with self-harm and other violence for that matter and the literature in this area is really difficult because there are lots of methodological problems in the research around this and there are there is some evidence that psychotic symptoms the severity of psychotic symptoms are are linked to increased rates of self-harm and violence but because the findings are in consistency it's quite difficult to pull out exactly what but what seems to be the case is that it's the content of the symptom that's particularly important, not the severity of the symptoms. So it's not related to how ill a person seems, it's related to exactly what the psychotic symptoms are, what the experiences are. So understanding those is really crucial to understand how you can intervene. So things that you might think are obvious are implicated. So people being very paranoid, people misinterpreting things around them, command hallucinations and sometimes these have been referred to as threat control override symptoms so these are pretty obvious examples of the sorts of things that people might be saying that might be psychotic symptoms driving driving some of their thoughts of self-harm my neighbors are plotting to kill me and attack me mi5 are following my movements and want me dead or things where people feel that the control has been taken away from them so outside forces being in control of the mind, invisible men put thoughts into my head and guide me. So things that are likely to exacerbate, exacerbate those feelings of defeat, entrapment and hopelessness. 
So they, I guess, made quite a lot of sense. In relation to command hallucinations, actually, command hallucinations aren't always a precursor to self-harm or um, violence. It's not the type of command that's really linked to compliance, but often it's about the beliefs about the entity giving the commands, which are linked to whether people are more likely to act on self-harm commands. So sometimes there seems to be a pattern that belief in the person giving the command hallucination being a benign entity is more likely to be associated with self-harm. So someone who hearing a voice of someone that they trust or they believe um, is really meaning them well, say, take your own life, your life is rubbish, you know, there's something on the other side, come and join me on the other side. So person believing that that person was a benign entity may be more likely to act on that than someone who thinks it's someone who means, means them harm. Um, and there are also some things around harm other compliance as well, sort of aggression and violence. The other thing that's really important in the whole mix and the picture of, of trying to devise psychological interventions is the interpersonal environment in psychosis. And it's long been demonstrated to contribute to outcome in schizophrenia. People may be familiar with the expressed emotion uh, literature. And we know that the environment has been clearly related to relapse of symptoms, relapse of aggression and violence, but also self-harm. Um, and it's been highlighted very much in the family environment with regard to expressed emotion, but actually also in clinical environments, in patient wards, with staff and so on. So that's an important thing in the mix. And I think when we consider the way that we deliver services, we're delivering services in the context that actually may exacerbate some of those things because psychiatric services are often under-resourced. There often is low staff morale and often quite high staff turnover, which may destroy or make it difficult to develop relationships with people who have these difficult and complex problems. I'm just going to show you this quote. This is a really old quote, but I always tend to drag this out because it just, I think the, the sense of it to a certain degree still applies now, even though this is about 15 years old, this particular quote. And this was a quote that was published in The Observer taken from a mental health nurse working on an inpatient ward in London. Those working on acute psychiatric wards live in parallel worlds, filled with horrors that no one on the outside could ever try to imagine. We see atrocities every day and take them for normal. Every morning we brace ourselves for mayhem. I could start my day witnessing an attack on another member of staff or a patient or even be attacked myself. The only thing I can be sure of is that the risk of such violence is increasing. And I guess, yeah, I mean, maybe this is a little bit extreme, but I think some of this can resonate. And for those of you that have been in an inpatient environment, you may recognise this, is that actually this is an environment where we're trying to provide a safe, calm, therapeutic environment for people who may be uh, at risk or suicidal. And actually, these are very much not that sort of environment. And we've got a long way to go to create an environment that would not exacerbate a lot of the things that I've been talking about. Okay, and the other way um, side of the coin, and again, I'm referring back to some of the work that Camellia has done, which is looking at the other end of the coin. So we've been looking at psychological risk factors, but the other area of work is looking at how resilient people are and how we can build resilience, because that can be part of how we may be able to help people to cope better with their suicidal thinking. Cami did a really good review, 27 studies, and some of the key things which conveyed psychological resilience, which can be built up in terms of trying to provide psychological support, is around increasing perceived social support. The more people feel supported, the better they feel. They also felt that religious or some sort of spiritual support was really important. Being able to develop some definite reasons for living and to really feel that they had some positive personal skills and attributes. And they were things that tended to build up resilience for the individual. So again, you can see how those can be used in some sort of psychological intervention to build people's resilience. 
So the whole picture is a complex mix and trying to, we need to understand all the mechanisms that are going on psychologically and environmentally to be able to design and develop treatments that will help particular individuals. And that's really what we've been trying to do. So in terms of developing those psychological treatments, what's the evidence? Well, uh, we've got, we've done three trials and there are two in progress. So I'm just going to briefly take you through those and then we can have a bit of discussion. So these are the trials. Um, you don't necessarily need to know what they all are. I'm going to talk a little bit about them. So we've looked at working with people with psychosis in the community, working with prisoners at risk of suicide in HMP Manchester, looking at delivering this sort of therapy on inpatient wards, and two current trials, two big current trials, the CALMS trial, which is working with people with psychosis and suicidality in the community. Um, that one's just finished with 253 people followed up. And the PROSPECT trial, which Dan Pratt's leading, which is prisoners at risk of suicide, which is ongoing at the moment. So the first trial that was done, published in 2014 in Schizophrenia Research, that was led by Nick Tarrier. Um, that was with people who had psychosis who were living in the community. It was a real two-arm trial, 24 sessions of cognitive behavioural suicide prevention therapy based on the mechanistic treatments that I've been talking about, compared to just treatment as usual alone. Um, okay. I guess it's fairly safe to say that actually it was effective. Those that had the treatment improved more than the treatment's usual group um, on suicidal ideation and suicide probability. And also in relation to hopelessness, those underlying mechanisms, psychotic symptoms, depression and self-esteem. And this nice graph illustrates that in a nice way with the purple bars being the cognitive behavioral suicide prevention therapy in the green being the control. The next one was led by Dan Pratt. Uh, this was the one that was in prisoners. So again, another straightforward um, RCT, two-arm RCT in a prison setting. Um, I don't need to say, but it was, it was very straightforward in terms of cognitive behavior therapy like the previous trial compared to treatment as usual. Plus what happens in a prisons, which is the Prison Suicide Prevention System Act, um, which is, is monitoring people and just looking out for risk factors. Um, again, there was quite a large effect size for the um, intervention, um, which was quite good in terms of uh, the trial, but because it was a pilot, it wasn't significantly different, but um, good outcome as a start. This is the more recent one which I led, which was the one in the inpatient settings that was published in the BJP Open. And this was a pilot study to investigate feasibility and acceptability of cognitive behavioral suicide prevention therapy for people in acute psychiatric wards. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this one. So why did we focus on inpatient suicides? Well, because suicidal inpatients have continuous 24 direct contact with staff, so they ought to be the most preventable of all suicides because we are there, we are looking after people. We shouldn't be in a position where we um, are able, you know, people are able to, to take their own lives in that environment. So we should be able to prevent them. But we're not that good at that because suicidal behavior is certainly still highly prevalent in psychiatric wards. Um, many people who are admitted to psychiatric wards are suicidal. We know people are readmitted frequently for repetition of suicidal behaviour. 2018, there were 74 inpatient deaths in England. It might be the UK, we'll have to check that. Um, so quite a lot. Um, but also that three months post-discharge is a real risk period. So once people have been in an inpatient unit and get discharged, they're really at risk of taking their life at that time. So the rates increase as they get discharged. And treating suicidal inpatients is expensive. And I don't mean financially, particularly, it is expensive financially. 
but it's really, really traumatic personally for individuals, the families and the staff on the wards as well who are having to deal with the management of that risk and the aftermath of a suicide when people are in their care, which is really pretty traumatic. Um, our usual NHS treatment for suicidal psychiatric inpatients is frequent risk assessments, observation, medication, containment, maybe some one-to-one -one timed with named nurse, which doesn't tend to be a psychological therapy, maybe ward activities and groups, but psychological therapies are pretty sparse on a lot of wards or they're completely absent. Um, and some of the um, environmental challenges in inpatient settings um, are quite notable. Because they are such risky places and because staff are worried about events happening when people are in their care, often it's true to say that security factors override aesthetics of the environment. So risk management is paramount and staff have this really tricky dual role where they have to keep people secure and prevent them from harming themselves. And it's very difficult then to be also people who are delivering therapeutic approaches. So they have this strange dual role, which is, is quite challenging for many members of staff. Oh, I've got stuck again. Me. Um, and psychiatric inpatient world, some of the challenges is that they are pretty unpredictable, chaotic environments. Again, don't know what I keep doing here. Okay. Um, and generally, they're not that well geared up for delivering psychological therapy because there's very little individual autonomy. There's there's actually not really any privacy on psychiatric wards. So trying to find a, a room to deliver therapy on is quite tricky. Um, there tends to be a high staff turnover. It's quite stressful for staff working in that environment. So sometimes there may not be a great morale. It tends to be quite crowded. We tend to have to use a lot of agency staff who may not have the same you know, ability to build up relationships because they're only temporary. And of course, it's a highly acute group of complex, risky patients in that environment. So there are quite a lot of challenges. And often it results in people um, staying on the wards, patients on the wards, being a little bit dissatisfied as to what's happening. So some of the key questions we wanted to ask, can we successfully implement psychological therapies in that ward environment, given all the challenges? Is it feasible and acceptable to staff who are trying to you know, deliver care in that environment and to obviously the patients themselves? And what impact does it have on key outcomes, things like length of stay, suicidality and so on? And we delivered an intervention which was delivered over six months. So we picked people up when they came onto the inpatient ward and they were suicidal, offered them this treatment. We knew that they might be discharged within that time. If they were, we continued to deliver it in the community. So they were offered up to 20 sessions, one-to-one -one with a psychological therapist. It was delivered roughly weekly, but it did depend on the needs of the patient. It may have been more often sometimes. And it was collaborative. It was a one-to-one -one intervention based on cognitive behavioral treatment for suicide, based on the principles I've talked about previously targeting those key factors which underpin suicide, hopelessness, entrapment, defeat, psychotic symptoms if they were present, uh, and then really using CBT principles to address those suicidal thoughts and feelings, with very much a focus on staying well and maintenance of recovery. These were the outcomes we were looking at, the usual things, suicidality and so on. We we're also looking at whether it was cost effective as well. Um, this is on the suicide probability scale, and I'm presenting this really to give you a good idea of what sorts of people we were working with in the environment. Nearly all, 78%, um, were in the severe end on the suicide probability scale. I mean, that is quite severe to be scoring that high. So this is a, a really difficult, challenging group with very, very high degrees of suicidality. So was it feasible? Well, the findings suggested it was. 
70 people consented, we randomised 51. People took up a mean number of about 12 sessions, although that did vary quite a lot, um, as illustrated in this uh, bar graph. For the service users, we did loads of qualitative work. And one of the things that really struck us was how much the service users on the ward wanted it and valued it. They really wanted psychological therapy. Um, and that's evidenced as well by some of the data on the take up of the sessions and the follow up in the community. Um, we measured therapeutic alliance um, between the therapist and the patient. And despite the complexity, despite the degree of suicidality, Engagement in therapy was really good. And the therapeutic alliance that we measured was very similar to what we found in other CBT studies without these types of complexities, which was quite encouraging. And actually staff really quite liked it as well. They generally felt it was well received and didn't cause them too much trouble. It wasn't too disruptive, which was some of the fears of some of the staff at the beginning. But what I can say is that we really did have a lot of adverse events during the trial. Adverse events are something that we're required to monitor as part of a research trial, but it does give an ind indication, I think, of the, the degree of challenges of working with the group. And we recorded 255 serious adverse events, and these are events that are life-threatening for individuals being... Um, doing things that were life-threatening during Insight. And given it was quite a small group, this was really, really high. Um, it was a big range, of course. I think it really highlights the stressful environment staff are working in. None, though, were considered to be anything to do with the research or taking part in the psychological therapy. They were to do with other factors. They were no more frequent in those that got therapy compared to those who were in the treatment as usual group. So engaging in a psychological in intervention didn't increase risk, which I think was some of the fears of some of the staff on the ward. So what have we learned? Well, suicidality is a real problem with people with psychosis. But we do know from all of the trials, you know, even in really difficult uh, environments such as a prison and inpatient wards. They're feasible, they're acceptable, and they're really welcomed by patients. There's some evidence of effectiveness, but of course there are challenges to the impl Im implementation and the rollout. Our next results are our next trial, which is ongoing, just about finished. So we've stopped recruiting to the large multi-site CALMS trial. This is again psychosis and suicidality people living in the community so this is a big follow-up trial um, of effectiveness and mechanisms underpinning suicidality um, and the prison one is a little bit later i think so i'm going to stop there um, so watch this space in terms of some of the results that we're going to have coming out over the next few months thank you very much i am aware that a lot of the things that i've talked about today are really distressing experiences, experiencing suicide, experiencing psychosis. So um, I do understand that some of the issues raised may be quite difficult. So please do get in touch and use any resources you have available to you if you, if you need to. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jill. I'll just pause the recording there. I won't record the questions. Um, and then we open up to questions. If we take questions in the chat, that's probably easiest given 